Hi, I'm your host, Johnny Wilkinson, and welcome to this episode of I Am. This week's guest is Bernardo Castrop, a doctor of computer programming, also a doctor of the philosophy of mind. He specializes in looking very, very deeply, may I add, at the nature of reality and what it's all about, what life's all about. In this podcast, Bernardo takes us far and wide in all kinds of directions, challenging so many things that we've taken for granted. I have to make a warning here though, there is mention of suicide in this episode and there's conversation around death too. So please do though, make sure you navigate this part of the conversation in the way that feels right for you. It takes place around the one hour 28 mark and lasts for five minutes. It's really key, I think, that knowing skipping it won't affect the rest of the podcast at all. I fully appreciate how difficult and sensitive this topic can be, so please treat it and yourself with utmost compassion. But I would urge you, though, to come back to it and stay to the very end, because when you hear it in its entirety, Bernardo's story is one that holds a a real unlocking kind of force in it, one that for me just breathes freedom and inspiration. So I hope that you really enjoy this podcast. And if you want to hear more, then do head over to the Tuesday episode just before this one. These Thursday episodes are just for the guests, though. I feel they have so much to offer, so much possibility and opportunity in what they're talking about, what they've been through. So I don't want to waste any more time on me. Thanks for your support. Thanks for sticking with the podcast. Feel free to subscribe to it. Give it a like if that's what you fancy. I cannot wait to catch up with you and get stuck into the next one. I am Johnny Wilkinson. This is the I Am Podcast with Bernardo Castro. Bernardo Castro, thank you so, so much for joining me here on this podcast. I Am Podcast. I've got so much to talk to you about, ask you about. There's never going to be enough time, but it's a privilege to be here with you. So thanks for for making yourself available. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, would you mind, because I'm, I'm already taking a leap, I think, with people that might know me from a sporting background to where you might be coming from that might be considered a leap from people and, and to get the ball rolling would you mind just giving us a bit of a a background about what it is that you specialize in what your your kind of passion is and and anything else you want to you want to throw in there that that might sort of set the foundation for this conversation okay um i have a doctorate in computer science and a, a doctorate in uh, philosophy of mind both are my passions and they are more related than one would uh, initially <laughs> think and um amongst Other things I've done in my life, I think about the nature of the self, the nature of reality, what is life all about? What is this condition that we call being alive, such a weird condition? What is the world? And I think our mainstream views about it are completely untenable, downright silly. Right. You've just bridged that gap for me. Perfectly. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) The human potential side is really, really interesting because to give you a quick background so I can sort of set the scene... I had a a long sporting career, but it was plagued with mental health issues, but I'd actually call them just crises moments where essentially I came up against situations which became insurmountable due to my stance upon them, a stance I didn't know I at the time I could really work with. So I just came up against these obstacles that were essentially life and I was working against them and it it was a, a Mexican standoff almost. And I think what that meant was my stance was one of great fear, but call it a a hole inside that I was trying to fill with achievement, with somehow external success and what we might later go on to talk about as a a material kind of gathering from my experiences. I managed to do all of that mostly because of the sheer intensity of the fear. My drive to achieve was was almost impossible to to live with for many. And as such, I was able to imprint my formula for success and make it work, but at a great cost. The great cost above everything being that it didn't work at the end. The other great cost was be that, that I never shifted in terms of that crisis and I met more and more of it and actually more severe as, as it went along. The other part of it, I think, is talking about that crisis is that I had lots and lots of interventions in terms of professional help and also explored a lot of things on my own. And it got to a stage later in my life where I was at a, a moment of a bit clearer understanding as I was trying to go from, okay, I have to change. It's not, it's not the world that needs to change, that I need to control and move. It's me that has to move. But for some reason, there was a greater interest in me that was about, well, what's underneath the movement from one to another? 
what's not moving? Because whatever I move to, I'm going to meet problems there as well. So I got actually more interested in the unchanging idea of what's there and that potential. And that led me into everything from Buddhism. And the, I went to quantum physics, which I found fascinating how those two aligned, and then into self-inquiry and, and everything therein, but never losing sight of the goal of performance, the desire to to actually go out there and still perform and express passion. It wasn't a kind of retreat away from active life. It was a, a movement deeper into that engagement. And it is from this angle that I really want to let you now take the floor and just say, first of all, what does human potential mean to you in the way that you see life at the moment? Life is something nature is doing. And we cultivate, I think, in Western culture, especially the, the, the self-help and well-being uh, part of Western culture, we cultivate a totally absurd idea about what it is to live uh, a good life. It starts from the notion that your life is about you, which if people hear me say this now, they go like, yeah, well, of course, right? Your life is about you. My life's about me. Uh, this is a completely unnatural idea of what life is about. Life is something nature is doing. We are not born in a vacuum. We are a part of nature. We are something nature is doing. So, of course, our lives are not about us. Our lives are about whatever it is that nature is doing. And you can develop the attitude of being in the way of that, or you can develop the attitude of going along with that. But because we think our life is about us and that we have some kind of moral, almost religious, metaphysical responsibility for being happy all the time, which is utterly impossible and unnatural, we add insult to injury because not only do we not manage to be happy all the time, we feel guilty for not managing to be, to be happy all the time. We think there is something wrong and inadequate with us. And all the while, all there is going on is nature doing what it does. It's just our cultural narratives that sort of get in the way of that and inform us, I would say, wrongly. Uh, about what life is all about. And we make it a lot worse on ourselves. I think human potential is something that is much more than personal. The realization of the human potential begins with noticing something as simple as that, noticing our place in nature. What is going on in nature as far as we can see and what place do we occupy in that a drama of eons within which human history is less than the blink of an eye. It, it began not yesterday, it began last second. And if you have an embodied realization of that, I think you are already halfway towards realizing the human potential because we are tools of something much bigger than us. Uh, and our only choice is to willingly be those tools or get in the way of it, which I don't think helps realize our potential. It's really interesting because I, I remember actually hearing someone talk about how even this solar system amongst all solar systems is such a tiny thing. And this planet amongst other planets is such a tiny thing. And this country we're in compared to all the rest of the world, such a tiny thing. And eventually it comes down to, but, but me right here, I'm a big man. <laughs> And that's where the, the importance comes is that it's that kind of movement into the individual space. When you say it's a, you know, it's a cultural thing, how does that come about in your eyes? How does that come about in terms of we're born into it? I remember hearing Rupert Spire, someone we've spoken to, talking about the two models, the, the consciousness model and the material model of the material model being you're born into a world that's, that appears to be already existing in the body is the brain, in the brain is the mind, in the mind is the consciousness, and you operate from there versus the alternative model. How, how do you see that, that individuality and why is it so prevalent? Why is it not normal to see things the, the other way around? Oh, well, it began arguably late in the re uh, Renaissance and early in the Enlightenment when there was this schism between nascent science and the church. And the church was all about the soul, which is in Greek, psyche. And psyche means also mind, consciousness. So the church was all about mind, consciousness, psyche. And the church proved 
perfectly capable of burning you at the stake if you would contradict its dogma. And Bruno was burned at the stake at the dawn of the 17th century, in the year 1600. So early scientists had to carve out a space for themselves so they could do their work without being threatening to the church. And this whole idea of a, a type of existent, a type of substance that is outside and independent of mind, not your mind alone, not my mind alone, but mind in general, a different kind of substance that is non-mental, which we call matter. The whole invention of this thing served the purpose to carve out a sort of social political space for scientists, early scientists, to not be killed while doing their work. And uh, Denis Diderot, one of the founding fathers of the Enlightenment, one of the two co-authors of uh, La Encyclopédie, he's on record saying, well, materialism doesn't quite work, it's incomplete, but we need it in order to fight the church. But at some point between mid and late 19th century with Darwinism and the idea that if religion was wrong about the origin of the species, then all of religion is wrong. And then matter is no longer just a sort of a theoretical abstraction that keeps you safe. It became truth because if part of religion is wrong, then all of it is wrong. And therefore there is no psyche. There is only this other thing we invented 200 years ago and we forgot that we invented it and we forgot why we invented it. And that move led to a crisis of meaning because human beings always anchored their meaning on transcendence, on that uh, dimension of mystery that there is behind the world. The world is not flat. It's the superficial appearance of something that is unfathomable and not conceptually capturable by human beings. We always have known that throughout history. But in the late 19th century, we decided that now it, the appearance is the thing in itself. Uh, the material world is not only an appearance, it is all there is. There is no extra dimension of meaning. So we lost that anchor on transcendence to derive our meaning, and we had to find an alternative. And Nietzsche, his life is an example of the mad attempt, desperate attempt to find that alternative. He came up with the notion of the Ubermensch, the Superman, which he never really explained what the Superman was supposed to be. He only said that man is a sort of intermediary step towards the Superman, and the Superman would be the embody of meaning without transcendence. In psychology, we call it fluid compensation. If you lose a, a source of meaning, you have to compensate by inventing another. And Nietzsche, which is the microcosm of what the whole Western mentality did, Nietzsche tried to replace that fountainhead of meaning that was anchored in transcendence, religion, if you will, with humans themselves. So you would have to become superhuman. We would have to transcend ourselves in order to find meaning again, which is, of course, a very courageous call, but uh, it is impossible. And we are still trying and we are still failing. And that's where this whole notion that your life is about you has its origins. You have the moral responsibility in Western culture to perform an impossible feat, to become the superman and derive meaning without mystery. Make meaning. That's what existentialists started talking about. You have to make meaning, which is, of course, a direct contradiction. If you have to invent meaning, then there is no meaning. Mm -hmm. You're cheating yourself. You're deluding yourself. But it's still the struggle we are in 150 years on. We are still trying to become the Superman and our entire well-being industry is geared towards trying to convince us that we can perform this impossible feat. Let's see how long we'll keep hitting our heads against this wall. It's interesting because the, I bring it back to my sporting analogies. They tend to work best. But for that brief time on a weekend in the middle of a sporting arena, you find yourself what, what might be described as being in the zone, for example. And the feeling, again, is not, it, it's just an experience of, you mentioned it at the beginning, just talking about being part of life, is that you kind of assume a greater perspective, just a bigger understanding of, of where it's not about having a personal influence that you're changing things but you you understand that that you're part of something bigger i find it often you know the transcendence of of time a future past because you, you things are happening and you, you don't know whether you knew it was going to happen did you make all this happen or has it just happened how did you know it's going to happen but there's just this absolute effortlessness about it there is complete engagement but on a different level 
the physical stress, which is what most people think I think of engagement, is you've got to get stuck in. It's like, but actually that engagement was effortless. It was almost like a, a liberating of the self into just that incredible oneness. And yet the rest of the time in between, there's this understanding for me that of causality, that getting to that space of engagement came from stressing and suffering and all this kind of immense pressure and 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 whatever it might be upon everything, mental, emotional, physical levels. And of course, you know, it, it made no sense, it made no sense that you could leap from stress to joy and that there'd be some sort of link there that says this is happening. Although I understand, you know, some people have, have gotten to such a state internally that they almost fall through the bottom of the conditioning into into that space. But with this idea about becoming the Superman or whatever, that experience of being in the zone, how do you relate to, where does that fit in? Where does that subjective experience of something far bigger, how does that work? Notice that you're talking about being in the zone and one of the key characteristics of being in the zone is when you are no longer your individual self. You forget exactly. about yourself. That, that's yeah. the key ingredient of that state. And that can happen in different ways, just by relaxation. When you don't get on the way of nature, you will be naturally in the zone. Or, and that's that will sound contradictory, if you try very hard continuously to be the Superman, non-stop, at some point, you will get so exhausted that you will fall out of the way, if you know what yeah. I mean. And then you will just suddenly find yourself in the zone and you have no idea how you got there. You got there because you were exhausted and you just couldn't muster the energy to continue to stand on the way. I think the most harmful part of our narrative today is the notion that we largely understand what's going on. Because that makes our world very claustrophobic, since the understanding we, we do have that the physical world is causally closed, it, it leaves no space for meaning. And we think that we understand a lot because we can produce all these technology toys that, that work. And they are incredibly sophisticated, so we must understand a lot. And therefore, there is no meaning to life, because... Our understanding is such that there is no extra dimension of meaning and depth and mystery left. I think this is a form of utterly unnecessary self-torturing because we haven't even begun to understand what's going on. And you might ask, well, how, how come technology works? I, I like to use the following metaphor. Suppose you're a five-year-old kid and you know how to play, talk about a game from my time. I'm, I'm a node bum. Suppose you know how to play Space Invaders very well. <laughs> I know it well. So you can be world champion of playing Space Invaders. You play the game very well. You know that if you shoot at that alien, you score points. And if that little thing falling from the sky hits you, you die and you don't score points. The fact that you can play that game so well and be world champion, does that mean that the five-year-old kid understands what's going on? all the hardware and software that's going on to create space invaders. Does the kid understand that those aliens are just patterns of open and closed uh, microscopic electronic switches in silicon chips made from sand and doped with all kinds of other materials? No, the kid has no idea what's going on. What the kid has is a convenient fiction. In other words, a story that is false, but works. And the story goes like this. I have a real cannon and I'm shooting real aliens falling from the sky. And if that thing touches me, I, I die. And if I shoot him, I score points. Is that what's going on? No, not at all. It doesn't begin to capture what's going on. It's just a false narrative. But things behave or the game behaves as though that narrative were true. And that's all it takes. Now, take that back to our ability to develop technology. We are the five-year-old kid. We have a narrative about nature that is such that things work as though the narrative were true. Just as the narrative the kid has that he's shooting space aliens, the game works as if that narrative were true. The same about our material or physical world being you know, the foundational level of reality. It's a narrative that works if you're trying to develop toys. But if you're trying to find the meaning of our existence and what life is, this strange localized fight against entropy, what a weird condition is this thing called life? What a weird condition is 
this universe with quasars and supernovae and black holes in which radio waves are supposed to be vibrations, but they go across the vacuum. How can a vibration go across something where there is nothing to vibrate? What the hell's going on? <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have all these models that work, but we don't know what's going on. And, and knowing that we don't know is critical to avoiding the claustrophobia of existential depression, avoiding the delusion that life has no meaning, which is an expression of profound arrogance. How the hell do you know that your life has no meaning? What can you know? To decrete yourself to the point that you actually believe it, that your life has no meaning, that the whole thing is pointless. You, you, you have no clue what's going on. None of us have. And, and that's a healthy attitude to cultivate because what I think, and I just contradict myself now because I said we have no clue of what's going on. I suspect that what is really going on is that this is all dance in mind. We are parts of the mind of nature. Matter is what mental processes look like from a certain perspective, from across a dissociative boundary to speak technical language. And at the ground of reality, at the bottom level, the foundational level of nature, there is no separation. There is no this and that, past and future, here and there, you and me. All this emerges as a sort of a cognitive dance. And if you understand this, then you understand that the material world is just an image. It's like the dials on a dashboard display about the real world outside. That's the physical world. It's the dashboard. It's not the real world. And the real world stands to be as much richer and deeper than a dashboard as the sky outside is richer and deeper than the dashboard of an airplane. You know, the dashboard may tell you about the great lightning storm outside, but when you have a look at that lightning storm, it's a whole other business. And we are banging in the middle of that. We only have the dashboard perception to interact with it, but we are banging in the middle of all that depth, all that meaning, all that mystery. And becoming aware of it is half the way towards solving the claustrophobic issue of existential depression and lack of meaning, I think. Do you think part of this life movement, if you like, is a shift in that direction? Is there is there a potentially a shift that has to take place in that direction because of the the understanding, maybe not of what of where to go, but maybe that where we are going is not the place to go, and that a shift will come in in, in a different. I know, obviously, you can highlight different areas and cultures and and even small communities or people trying albeit not the right verb at all because it's part of the stress, but at least looking into another deeper way. I think that's ultimately inevitable. I think what's happening today, though, and has been happening for the past century, well, maybe two centuries since the beginning of the Romantic movement, is a more or less naive search for an alternative based on some sentimentalist, idealistic, not metaphysical idealism, but a morally idealistic picture of nature that at the ground level, nature is all about happiness and contentment. I, I don't think that holds water. And I think that's why for people who are really seriously engaged with life and have understood how much suffering there is inherent in life, that idealized sentimentalist romantic story doesn't really stick. Uh, you know, maturity grows Teflon on your skin, and 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 those those kinds of stories, you know, they throw it at you, but they don't stick. Psychologically, you are, we are incapable of going down that road. We understand that we are being gullible and trying to deceive ourselves, which doesn't mean that there is nothing in that direction. There might very well be, and I think there is something to achieve in that direction, which will come because. Look, whatever the truth is, we are banging in the middle of it and, and we are part of it. We may not see it. We may refuse to understand it. We may not have the conceptual arsenal to allow us to corral the truth into a narrative that makes logical sense for human beings. We have developed the ability to think conceptually only 30,000 years ago. I mean, <laughs> we have just been born last yeah. second. So we don't have yet the capability to articulate what's really going on with our conceptual uh, arsenal. But whatever is going on, even if we can't conceptualize it, we are in the middle of it. And I think it's like water on hard stone, you know, if, if it keeps hitting it, eventually it will break through because our recipes just don't work. 
people who are successful know that better because if you will have a untenable story in your mind about what it takes for you to be happy, if you don't succeed in getting that, that you think that will make you happy, it will always remain a carrot hanging in front of you. And you will keep on entertaining that idea that if only I had that house, that blonde or that car, then I would really be happy. And, and you may die thinking that because you haven't achieved, but if you achieve, that's when the going really gets tough because then you realize, okay, I am there. Am I happy? No, very, very, very little changed. I'm not neglecting existential needs, which people in Ukraine now don't have. We do. There's a big difference. But once you've covered that ground, once you have enough to eat the roof over your head, the recipes we get from our culture, they prove hollow the moment you succeed in implementing them. And then there are two types of people in terms of the reactions they have to that realization. Some people insist on playing the same game because that's the only game they know. And that's why Rupert Murdoch in his 80s is still talking about mergers and acquisitions. He knows nothing else. I'm sure that's not working for him, but what else will he do? The other type of person is the one who bites the bullet and says, okay, Everything I was told about what this is all about, where I should go, and what will make me happy and give me a feeling of fulfillment and close that gaping abyss in the middle of my chest, everything I've been told about it is just wrong. Our culture is adolescent. It gives you a recipe that works for the first half of life, but fails completely miserably for the second half of life. And now we cannot follow recipes anymore. Now we are experimental cooks. Now we have to find the trail open a trail ourselves. <laughs> there isn't a trail that somebody already traversed before us because our culture is adolescent. And that systemic fulfillment will eventually start getting passed on across generations. In other words, young parents today, I don't think they feel that comfortable anymore about telling their kids, look, it's a house, a white picket fence, a dog, a wife, and three point two kids, whatever, 2.4 kids, whatever four, yeah. that is. And then you will be happy or you work for the same company your whole life and you work hard. And, and that's, that's what life is all about, to have a good life. You work hard. And I don't think people can tell that story anymore because they know it at the very least, not a complete story. So it, this will start percolating down the generations and the collective consciousness of our culture will start having to face this and have to take a few steps back and to the point where we took a wrong turn and review and change our hidden assumptions about the nature of what's going on and what does it all mean and how do you go about having a fulfilling life? And many people learn it on their own, but again, they tend to romanticize it as well. They tend to think that what happened to apply to them should apply to everybody else. And things are always a lot more subtle, complicated and nuanced than that. But I do think it will have to happen because you cannot have a chronically unfulfilled civilization for very long. That civilization will either destroy itself or it will find its way out of the trap that it has fallen into not that long ago. I mean, one of the things you mentioned about the unfulfillment there is quite interesting how you mentioned people play the same game. I think it, a strong point of that was retirement, you know, that sense that I'll be happy when I've come into retirement and it's not there. And you think, well, now's the time. But unfortunately, the next one is, well, once I've left my legacy, then I'll be happy, which means I've got to die first before I'm happy. And, and that one, <laughs> there's no coming back from. So it, it's, I can see the the momentum of that cycle and that habitual thing. And you mentioned there about the hidden assumptions within us and about the cultural influence upon the next generation and the parents influence and everything but within the individual's makeup you mentioned hidden assumptions i mean obviously in society's makeup as well but those hidden assumptions are we sort of referring to the same thing now as talking about limiting beliefs when you talk about the absolute state of i do not know the humility to be able to shed everything that has built up this idea of who I am, this this almost physical existence of me in the world doing something that is almost confusing and shadowing the experience of living. Are these hidden assumptions essentially just in the way of that? When they're removed, we, we're getting closer to that I do not know that is 
something we can't necessarily report back on when people say, what's it like to be in the zone? You sort of go, oh, as soon as I say something, it just ruins it. I think we make a whole lot of assumptions. And then, look, if you want to reform the house, the first step is to get the garbage away. And and that first step is not too difficult because the garbage is very self-evident. Um, so we I can speak more specifically about that because that's a metaphysical point. We have this idea that the world is fundamentally something other than mind, that matter is something other than mind. It's outside and independent of mind. And it's somehow you can describe matter fully with a list of numbers. So if you say that's the weight, that's the electric charge, uh, that's the length, that's the frequency, the amplitude, if you make that list of numbers long enough, then you will have said everything there is to say about reality, about matter. And mind is just some kind of byproduct of brain activity, some you know, uh, ephemeral structures of matter that come to an end. And therefore, everything you learn in your life, all of your insights that you've achieved through great suffering, ultimately they are for nothing because they are going to disappear when you die. And therefore, all of your suffering was for nothing. And by the way, neither are your achievements because given a million years, they are gone. Nobody will know. Nobody will remember. You know, and, and the universe will die either a heat death or it will collapse again into a singularity. And then it would have been all for nothing. And we think we know this. We think these are facts. Not because we have thought these things through, but because the entire culture around us is telling us these are facts. How could everybody be so wrong for so long, right? Obviously, this is right. Well, Look at history. Everybody has been very wrong all the time. <laughs> century after century, the longest you look back in history, everybody was wrong all the time. Why do we think that we are right now, especially when there is plenty of evidence that we are very wrong? The whole notion of matter is something outside mind. It began when we started describing this world of colors we see around us, which is mental. Colors are experiences. They are qualitative in nature, not quantitative. There is something it is like to see red, to see the, the, the blue sky, to taste a, a strawberry, to fall in love, to have a bellyache. These are qualities. That's the entire entirety of existence as far as we know by direct acquaintance. Qualities. We came up with quantities to describe these qualities. So if I would tell you that rock weighs five kilos or that rock weighs 50 kilos, then you know what quality to expect if you were to try to lift the rock. All these numbers were descriptions. But at some point we said, you know what? The description is primary. The description comes before the thing described. The map comes before the territory. And somehow nature created this structure called the brain that somehow pulls the territory out of the map. Mm -hmm. And because we don't know how that works, we call it a problem. It's technically called the hard problem of consciousness. There's nothing about physical parameters in terms of which we could deduce the qualities of experience. We have no idea how brain stuff uh, electrochemical processes could possibly generate the redness of red, the sweetness of, of, of a strawberry. But we call it a problem and we promise ourselves that in version two or three of the map, we will be able to pull the territory out of the map. We just don't know how to do it yet, which is incredibly stupid. And if you take a step back and you realize that don't, not only logic is telling you we've taken the wrong turn, but evidence too, because you know what? How do psychedelics create the most intense experience of people's life? The richest, the most intense experience of people's lives. They do that by dramatically reducing brain activity. They don't light up your brain like a Christmas tree. They, they, they put your brain, I, I, I like to say they put your brain to sleep, but even that is not correct because your brain is quite active when you're sleeping, not when you are under psychedelic influence. Or that foundations of physics is telling us now for over 40 years with consistent experimentation that physical properties cannot be said to exist prior to being measured. That the physical world is the result of measurement. Just like the indications in the dials of an airplane's dashboard, they are the result of the measurement made by the airplane's sensors. The sensors of the airplane measure the world outside and the result of that is displayed on the dials of the airplane's dashboard. The physical world is the dashboard. So if you don't measure, 
there is no physical world. Of course, if the sensors don't measure, the diodes show nothing. Is that mysterious? Not at all. But because we, we decided that we know that all that exists is the physical world, we get all discombobulated by these experiments. We think, and that's the press saying this, we think they refute reality. Of course they don't. Of course there is a world out there. There is the thing that is being measured. It's just not physical. Physicality is the result of measurement. Now, if you understand and accept this, then, hey, what is it that's going on? Because whatever that is, I'm a part of it. If what's going on is mentation, not my mentation, not your mentation, but transpersonal mentation, and when I measure that mentation, I get physical stuff, then what can I derive from this realization about the meaning of life? Because if everything is mind, then I'm just a sort of dissociated complex of mind. If life itself is what dissociation in the universal mind looks like, then death is the end of dissociation. Not the end of consciousness, not the end of mind. On the contrary, it's an expansion of consciousness, an expansion of mind. All the hard-earned insights I've accumulated throughout my life, through tremendous suffering, through failure, through all that, through pain, disappointment, heartache, regret, all anxiety, all that stuff that characterizes life. Everything I've learned from that now goes to the mind of nature. Now my life is a means to an end. It's sacrificial in the sense of making sacred. What you learn, you contribute to a larger cognitive context, the mind of nature. Nothing is meaningless. Even if you don't believe it has any meaning, it doesn't change the fact that it's not. And it is so whether you see it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not. And now the physical world is just a superficial appearance. It's like a symbol. It's pointing at something beyond or behind itself, like the dashboard points at the unfathomable storm in the sky outside. Life becomes reinvested. The world becomes reinvested with that extra dimension of depth and mystery and meaning, which is an antidote to the arrogance of knowledge, to the to, to this incredibly naive notion that oh, we know what's going on and it's all for nothing. It has no meaning. So you reinvest life with that mystery with that depth and you realize that the whole thing is not about you has never been you are something nature is doing now but what is really going on that's the real you it's not the individual you it's not the person who was abused in childhood and regrets this and that and and is anxious about that and that no 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 no. that's just a doing it's not a thing the only thing going on, and that's what you actually are, is this thing that is that, that has no boundaries, that cannot be corralled into a narrative by monkeys that evolved yesterday on a regular planet of a banal galaxy. I mean, all of that arrogance gets diluted when you realize what nature is shoving under our noses all the time, but we refuse to see because we inherit recipes and narratives from culture. I've got so many questions, but... For me, going into the quantum physics side of it with a little, I think what you're referring to there with the observer principle, some of that stuff in there, as it moved on a bit from the, from the Schro- Schrodinger's cat idea, <laughs> presumably that's, I'm very low down in the basics there. It's technically, it's called the measurement problem and the, the observer principle, observer effect. This is in popular culture, but I understand what you mean. Yeah. With the quantum physics, what I found interesting was in this, in as far as it could go, is in the search for what we're made out of they basically came to the understanding that they couldn't find anything. Yeah, you know, what everything's made out of and and well they I'm sure they could find things. And at the boundaries it seemed as though there was no end. And yet it seemed very interesting to me at that time that we consider ourselves to have a start and an end and be a, a finite thing in what is, as far as science can go, an infinite phenomena. We have somehow managed to create an idea that stands up somehow that we are finite and we will come and go. I know from my early childhood takes, the the concept of mortality and everything, I'm sure was so much behind what I experienced in sport. Losing a game was in a way a small sense of mortality, you know, a loss, a grief. And these things were so powerful in that they seemed so so capable of marking me and r- removing parts of me with each loss or whatever it be. But certainly that bigger picture of what happens at you know, death and the unavoidable nature of it is exploring that through this materialist kind of debunking almost. Is that worthwhile in terms of beginning that journey to remove at least that 
dark notion that, you know, it starts and it ends that allows us to have some space to give us some more time and patience and compassion with ourselves to, to explore things a bit more fully? I think it depends on the person. Some people, they do not need the intellectual permission from themselves to explore certain avenues, certain experiential avenues. They are by nature very open and by nature they don't really buy fully into any mainstream conceptual narrative. So they probably don't need a, a, a compelling reason and evidence-driven story so they can finally give themselves intellectual permission to perceive the world for the depth that it actually has. Other people, people like me, and I suspect people like you, need to give themselves intellectual permission before they can take any step. If you're about to take a step that you think intellectually doesn't make sense, it, 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 it doesn't add up, it contradicts reason or contradicts evidence, then your intellect closes you up. And the intellect is the bouncer of the heart. And then you can meditate for 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> that's a good expression. I've never heard of that before, but that's a good one. It depends on the person. For some people, the intellect is the bouncer of the heart. It is the case for me. If you don't give yourself intellectual permission, you can pray, meditate and trip for your whole life. And you still come back and say, yeah, no, no, no. That's all delusion, all gullibility, wish fulfillment and all that stuff. So for that kind of person, and I think unfortunately in our culture, most people are like that. If you are committed to reason and evidence, then the very least you owe yourself is to actually pursue what reason and evidence are pointing to. And not stop halfway, not stop with a half-baked story promoted by a science spokesperson who, is never, who has never been a scientist, who has made a career of just talking about stuff that they don't really know. They, they are not publishing. They're not actually looking <laughs> at, at what's happening. They're just spewing out narratives based on, you know, the polarities of our culture. And the UK, unfortunately, is full <laughs> of some of those people. So you owe it to yourself if you are married to reason and evidence, as I am, and I acknowledge that weakness. You owe it to yourself then to investigate more deeply what reason and evidence are telling you. Like, you cannot dismiss 40 plus years of results in foundations of physics because, as they say, if you think you understand quantum physics, then you don't understand quantum physics, which is probably the silliest, the silliest statement that can be made about quantum physics. Or at least understand that the people who don't agree with the conclusion that I arrived at, my conclusion is physics is telling us that matter is just a superficial level of nature. It's an appearance of a deeper layer, which is itself not material. That's my conclusion, which I think is inevitable to anyone who is intellectually honest. But there are people who disagree with that. Look at what they are saying. Look at the competition. Look at the narrative they are peddling. Look at it sincerely. Let's look at this. Sean Carroll, the guy who occupies Richard Feynman's chair today, he thinks that the right conclusion is not what I just said. The right conclusion is that there are countless gazillions of physical uh, universes, parallel physical universes, popping into existence out of nothing every infinitesimal fraction of a femtosecond for which we have precisely zero evidence. That's one of the alternatives. The other alternative is peddled by YouTuber Zabine Hosnefelder, who tells you that, no, 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 the reason the experiments look like they show that the properties of matter don't exist prior to measurement is that your detector settings change the thing observed. Now, this sounds technical. Let me, let me translate that into a metaphor. What she's saying is the following. If you break out your camera in the evening to photograph the moon and you go and you set aperture and exposure settings in order to photograph the moon, what she's saying is that depending on the aperture and the exposure you set on your camera, the moon will be something different. The moon will change because of your, the settings of your camera. And technically, this is called parting away with statistical independence. And it means exactly this. If you change the aperture in your camera, the thing you photograph has changed too. And then you can explain the experiments without saying that matter is not the foundational level of nature. But at what cost? 
you are parting with parsimony, with reason, with plausibility, with everything we've learned about what measurement means. This is the culture today. This is what people are offering as alternatives. So if you're married to reason and evidence, at least be consistent with your commitment and really understand what reason and evidence are leading to. I, I definitely know about the the marriage to reason and evidence. I, I think from my deeply sort of spiritual, well, I don't know the right word is, but journey or path or whatever it be, I feel blocked by the idea that I need to see it before I believe it or before I'm open to it. I need someone to put their thumb on my forehead and show me some kind of ridiculous experience and then I'll buy in. So I fully get that about the permission. And it's so, so interesting. One of the things that I found very, very exciting and helpful to a degree, at least it certainly opened doors in terms of some new space to go, was about the idea of how sleep and the, the, the sleep states, the dream states kind of give us a bit of a mirror, if you like, or at least some kind of insight into what could be happening on the universal level, but within the the subject itself. I don't know, you know, if, if you would have any thoughts or explain on that. I completely agree. There has been study done by Harvard University many years ago already. Dieter Barrett uh, was the lead researcher. They studied the dreams of people who suffered from dissociative identity disorder. It used to be called multiple personality disorder, when a person seems to have many so-called alters or alter personalities with different ages, different memories, different personality traits. Some of them know about the, the other's existence, sometimes they don't. So the, the, these people, the, the, their dream life was studied, and they turned out that for one quarter of patients of dissociative identity disorder, different alters partake in the same dream from their own unique point of view. And they see each other as characters in the dream. So if a person has three alters, let's say an adult male, a young female, and I don't know, a third alter, you can have the young female club the male over the head in the dream. And then after that, when the person is reporting the dream to a therapist, if the young female alter is in control, the young female will report a dream in which she clubbed the man over the head. She saw a man in the dream and she clubbed the man over the head. And then if the male alter is in executive control, narrating the same dream to the same therapist, the alter will say, well, I had a dream in which there was this young girl and she clubbed me over the head. <laughs> so the dissociated alters of a person suffering from dissociative identity disorder during a dream can not only see and speak to one another and both experience it from their own individual points of view, they can club each other over the head. I didn't make this up. This is actually in, in the technical literature. And that's a dead giveaway for what might be happening right now, right? We may be alters of the mind of nature and we all experience the same dream from our unique point of view and we club each other over the head too. <laughs> <laughs> but in order for us to exist in that dream... I mean, I'm sure people can prove me wrong here and that maybe they've done this, but to be awake and dreaming at the same time is, is something I've not heard too much about in the, the ability to, for a dream to be fully engaging and something you're fully involved in. You have to fall asleep for that dream character to be fully awake. And as you say, you know, that superhuman idea you mentioned earlier, the fact that we might walk around as absolutely recognising of I am the universal and I am fully the individual is perhaps a, a romantic notion that I've got sometime yeah. that I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing one day in my, in my life. It's great that you're pursuing this line of skepticism because that's what we need to do in order to, to, to achieve some degree of intellectual satisfaction. So let's think about this. What's the difference between the awake state and the dream state? The difference is the following. In the dream state, your experiences are purely endogenous. They are created from within through excitation of your own mind. They do not depend on a world outside your own individual mind. They are endogenous experiences. When you are awake, you're experiencing a world outside of your individual mind. So your experiences are modulated by sensory input. They are not entirely endogenous. Uh, maybe they are, their qualities are generated within, but at least they are modulated by something outside. Otherwise, we wouldn't be reporting that we live in a world that is consistent with what everybody else reports. 
That's the difference. In other words, the difference is that in one case, you're experiencing a world outside. And in the other case, you're experiencing the world within. But if you're talking about the mind of nature, the mind of the universe, there is by definition no, no world outside. It is impossible from that perspective. It, it's not even conceptually coherent to talk about the universal mind having an awake state. Because what we mean by an awake state is when you're experiencing something beyond yourself. By definition, there is nothing beyond the universal mind. So the only thing you can talk about are the endogenous experiences of universal mind. In other words, something akin to its dream life. So the, the metaphor, the comparison I made is actually the only one that is appropriate, that is conceptually consistent. You cannot compare our awake state to the universal mind, because there is no world outside for that universal mind to experience. The only thing you can compare with fairness is our dream life to the universal mind. And if you make that comparison, hey, <laughs> we learn a thing or two. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, and it's so powerful because it's something we long for every night to fall asleep. It's something that is, you know, I don't know how it's come about or what is behind it, but it's something certainly that you go a few nights without it and you'll do anything. The, the beauty of falling asleep and, and actually where we have no control. But I think that's really, really powerful. And there's a couple of things I, I want to sort of push on with, with regard to that outside world idea and certainly the materialism ideas. When you remove the idea of an outside world from the conventional perspective and then looking at it from an ex existential perspective, you remove causality and past and future, therefore you end up with the now. And I think what's interesting is certainly from my perspective, up until a certain point, everything I would have said was about what I'd been through. That's who I was, a result of everything I'd been through. And my future was going to define me also as everything I was about to go through and how the past and my understandings of the past were dictating essentially what my future was going to look like. And it was all mixed in. But when you remove the concept of an outside world, you're left with nothing but now. And therefore, you have to redefine what now is without past and future, I guess. I don't deny a world outside our individual minds. I think that would make any accurate model of nature, any account of nature impossible. Because whatever is going on, we seem to be inserted in a common context. If you were sitting next to me in my study right now, you would be describing my study in a way very consistent to how I would describe yeah, it. Sure. So we have to acknowledge that there is an outside context of, of some nature, outside our individual minds. But the fact that it's outside our minds doesn't mean that it is non-mental. And, and that's the conflation that uh, materialism or physicalism does. It goes too far in the right direction. Acknowledging the self-evident existence of an external world outside our personal minds doesn't imply or entail that that world is outside mind as an ontological category, as a type of, of existent. It may be mental too, but not in your mind. We all acknowledge that there is mentation that's not ours. I acknowledge you have thoughts. Your thoughts are objective to me. I cannot control them. You will be thinking whatever you're thinking, whether I like it or not, whether I know what's going on or not. Your thoughts, from my perspective, are objective. So I'm, I'm inviting people to think of the external inanimate universe in the same way that you think about the thoughts of somebody else. They are objective and external to you as an individual, personalized mind. But from their own point of view, they are subjective. Your thoughts, from your point of view, are subjective, they are mental in nature. And they appear to me as the configuration, material configuration we call your body. If I could put you in a brain scanner, I would take a reading of certain patterns of brain activity that correlate with, with your thoughts very well. But that only means that brain activity is what your mental inner life looks like when I observe it from across a dissociative boundary. It's the image of the phenomenon, not the cause of the phenomenon. That's where we go wrong. We mistake the appearance for the cause of the thing. And then everything becomes impossible to solve, of course. So I acknowledge an external objective world, objective from our point of view. All I'm saying is that from its own perspective, that world is subjective. It is mental. And what we call matter is what 
that transpersonal mentation, that those transpersonal mental processes look like upon my measuring them across a dissociative boundary. So I don't deny an external world. I, I deny something that isn't mental. Okay. Now, ultimately, you are correct, because if it's all only one mind and we are just dissociated alters of one mind, then the core subjectivity in me, the, the raw field of subjectivity that I am, is the same in you. It's the same in everybody else. It's the one field of subjectivity in nature. That's what you really are. And from the perspective of what you really are, then there is really nothing outside. But from the perspective of Johnny, from the perspective yeah. of Bernardo, there is indeed something outside. It's just mental. So looking at the the concept of the the now a little bit, so much of what we talk about comes from past. Everyone talking about, I mean, so much of what we talk about and think about is rooted in past. And where does past relate for you? How do you see past versus memory? And how do you see future versus imagination? Because my understanding of myself a little bit has been that the more I've bought into a reality of past, the less malleable and able I've been to play with my memory, the less access I've had, I think, to that kind of creativity in my imagination, if you like. And the, the more solid my past has become, as I was talking about before, the more this idea that this is how I got here to who I am, as opposed to what you were mentioning, that universal existential, maybe deeper footing. It, it's almost held me into a, I guess, a journey of constant crises moments because, you know, this is how I got here. This is how it's going to be. And I can't play with it because there's a truth in all of that. And yet, as soon as I look back, I'm feeling good on a certain day. I look back and, and think about a troubling time and it's no longer a troubling time. It's the secret to my amazing <laughs> moment. And yet when I'm in a bad mood, I look back on that same time and talk about it as if it was the universe against me and what a waste of effort, et cetera, et cetera. So I have an immediate experiential truth of realizing there is no straight meaning, concrete meaning to whatever I've made my mind up at the time. But how does, how does, memory and imagination play out for you now in your life? Has there ever been a moment in your life in which the past was anything other than a memory? No, absolutely not. Has there ever been a moment in your life in which the future was anything other than an expectation? No, absolutely not. So the past and the future are experiences now, right? The past is a memory you experience now. The future is an expectation you experience now. Yeah. And, and I absolutely adore this, but people fight back and, and even I can feel part They're of fight. me. Go ahead, go fight. No, 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 because <laughs> I've fought myself on this so long that I've exhausted myself. And I love, I love the unavoidable experiential depth to that truth for me at the moment. And let's go deeper because it gets okay. more interesting. <laughs> so we cannot point to the past and say, there it is. That's the past event. It's not anywhere. It's a memory you experience now. So it's right now. And the future is an anxiety, an expectation, an imagination that you experience right now. That's why you get anxious, because it's being experienced right now. But how long is the now? Is it yesterday and tomorrow? No. There is last minute and next minute. No. There is last second and next second. No. <laughs> and you can go on and on and on and on and on. And you realize that not even the present is there. It's infinitely small. doesn't matter how small you make it. It's a lot smaller than that. And you can keep playing that game forever. So we've just concluded that the past is in the present, the future is in the present, and the present isn't there. <laughs> this is the truth of the situation. Now, why is it so discombobulating? It's because of how our cognitive systems have evolved. So now let's go back to something that people can understand. We were born in the cockpit of an airplane that has no windows. There is no transparent windshield to see the world outside as it actually is. All you have are the dials on the dashboard. All we have always had are the dials on the dashboard. So our cognitive systems, our conceptual dictionary, has evolved to mirror the parameters of the dashboard. So if there is that little dial that moves like this along a certain dimension, that dimension will become a built-in assumption 
of our cognitive systems, of our ability to conceptualize things. That's space and time. Space and time are the dimensions of the dials on the dashboard because that's how our cognitive apparatus has evolved. It has evolved to learn about the world through those dials. So it speaks the language of dials. I speak dashboard, you speak dashboard, and nobody speaks reality because there is always the intermediation of the dashboard. We've never seen the world. Remember, you we were born in that airplane cockpit and we never had a window, transparent window to see what's going on. So we speak dashboard. And therefore, our language has verbs, actions that begin in the past and then in the future. It has objects and subjects, the subject here and the object there in time. Space-time are categories of perception. Schopenhauer echoed that sentiment or that conclusion later on. There is no space-time scaffolding objectively out there. It's just the way nature has found to allow us to cognize what's salient without being overwhelmed by too much data. So our, our, our dials are made in order to sort of take the information we have about the world and spread it out along certain axes and, and dimensions so we can make sense of things. In the world, there is no causality. In the world, there is no space-time. Can I speak about the world as it really is? No, because language didn't evolve to do that. Remember, we speak dashboard. We don't speak world. We don't speak reality. So the moment I open my mouth to say anything, I'm already presupposing space-time and causality. And we need to. There is no other way to play the game of social cooperation without speaking dashboard. It's all we have. It's very important to speak dashboard. Thank goodness we speak dashboard. But between that acknowledgement of the importance of dashboard and then mistaking the dashboard for the world and thinking, well, it's all dashboard. There is no world. That's when things go terribly wrong. You see, it, it, it's the same thing that happens when we say there obviously is a world beyond me. Therefore, that world is no mental. No, 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 no. That, that second part, you're going too far. We go too far all the time. We start in the right direction and then we step on the right spot and continue walking after that. And then, oh, we are off to the races. It happens all the time. Now, to understand what the world might be like, and now I'm not, I, I cannot describe it because I don't have language for it. So instead of describing it, I will point at it and I will hope that you will make the jump through your intuition without needing language. Alan Watts once had this wonderful metaphor about uh, sitting in front of a fence and there is a broken slit in that fence. So it's through that slit, you can see the other side and a cat walks on the other side. And when the cat walks, you first see the cat's head and then a second later, you see the cat's tail. And if the cat turns around and comes back, first you see the cat's head, then you see the cat's tail. And every time the cat walks by, you see the head and then the tail. So you would say with reason, the cat's head causes the tail. Because every time you see the head, a moment later, there comes the tail. The head causes the tail. Of course, that's causality. What is causality? Causality is the unawareness of the complete pattern. When you never see the cat, you only see the head and then the tail. You say the head causes the tail. That's causality. Causality is a conceptualization of a partial view of nature. There is never causality. There's only the bloody cat. All that exists is the cat, but we can't see the cat all at once. We have a slit, a temporal slit, that allows us to traverse nature in time. So we see the head and the tail and we say, oh, causality. Causality is okay. It's operationally effective. You know, it's because we think in terms of causality that we can develop computers and mobile phones and, you know, medical treatments and all that stuff. It's operationally useful, but it's not automatically true. And again, that's the mistake. We take something that's operationally useful, like the kid thinking I'm shooting aliens. The kid is world champion on based on that operationally useful story. But it's not automatically true. The kid has never shot aliens <laughs> coming from the sky playing Space Invaders, right? So the operational usefulness of our narratives must be preserved. What we must get rid of is extrapolating that operational usefulness into metaphysical truths that leads to a claustrophobic, meaningless view of reality and imposes on us suffering that we don't need to have. I don't know whether this rings 
true or is, is aligned with what you're talking about. But the idea, therefore, of who we are, the idea we hold, is that a way of being operationally useful in understanding the world by having an idea of who we are? Like you said, once we give ourselves a value, we can start to apportion a relative values and relative understandings around. I, I was sort of listening to a few things and with my own experience, kind of understanding that as a child, you have that innate freedom, albeit maybe slightly unconscious, that seems to get carried away and caught in that idea of who I am. And it seems that there's certain joy or, or liberation in returning to the childlike state, but at least through a conscious process. Is that in any way representative of you know, the world to say that to have an idea of who we are is functionally useful, but once we identify strongly with that as a, as a truth, we end up finding ourselves, as you said, in that suffering space. Absolutely. That's when the shit show begins. But look, you, you need to know to which mouth to bring the fork. If you don't have that, you're not going to serve nature. You know, you're, you're going to come to an end very quickly. But when you extrapolate and you say, my fundamental identity is this limited being within space-time, then you start in the right direction, but then you take 10 steps beyond the point. You're like the kid saying, that, well, I actually shot space aliens. It's completely dysfunctional to take it uh, that far. Having said that, I don't think we need to be enlightened to have a fulfilling life. The West's perception of what enlightenment might entail may even be distorted because there is a sense in which the Western narrative about you know nirvana and uh, you know, getting rid of the ego and all that is a sort of a stepping away from the world, not engaging with the world yeah. anymore. And I think that's also a different way of denying nature. You can deny nature by pretending that it is something it is not. And you can deny nature by not engaging with it. These are two forms of denial, I think. And, but that's my my own Western personality, which I've come to accept <laughs> later in life. I've come to accept myself as a, as a Westerner uh, after a period of being ashamed of it. I think the Western attitude to life is to engage with the images, to engage with life, to engage with Maya, but not to believe it. These are different things. I can engage with space invaders without believing that I'm actually shooting space aliens. I can still have fun. I can still learn something by engaging with life. Actors derive great insight from playing a role in a theatrical play. They know it's not true, but they engage with their character. They engage with the play. Whatever nature is doing, it's through that play. So I wouldn't deny that either. And if you look back in history to not that long ago, the West has always known to the point that it was so automatic that even to say that it knew it uh, is, 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 is inaccurate. But there is a sense in which we have always known in the West, the Christian West, that life isn't about us. There was no other way for people in the Middle Ages to bear life without this very natural, spontaneous understanding that life is not about them. Because who in the Middle Ages was happy in the way we think we should be today? Life was very hard. If you have 10 kids, about seven would die before five years old. Hmm. You would die very early in your 30s or 40s. Disease was rampant. Even before killing you, you would be debilitated. Things were dirty and cruel. Wars were ravaging. Rape was committed as, as if it were nothing. How do you bear that? if you think that life's about you and that you should be happy. It would be completely dysfunctional. People could bear that because they knew life was not about them. They knew that life is a form of sacrificial service, sacrificial in the original sense of the word, to make sacred. In other words, to serve something beyond yourself, to serve something bigger than yourself. People understood that life was something nature was doing and they were part of it. And that separating that from nature and saying it's about this part, it, it was completely nonsensical. So nonsensical, I don't think the thought would occur to them. Uh, if you would tell them, this is how I see the world, they would look funny at you. Like It's like um, people in the past not understanding the distinction we make between literal truth and metaphorical truth, which is a recent distinction as well. If you tell that to the exiled Jews in Babylon who wrote the Old Testament, you know, do you mean it literally or metaphorically? They would look at you like, 
what are you talking about? Because people thought analogically, in analogical thinking, there is no such distinction. The same goes for what life is all about. It's, it's a spontaneous understanding that comes from the root of our intuition. It's not the result of a conceptual narrative. It's not the result of a chain of thought that leads to a conclusion. It's something you embody, not believe. It doesn't even get to the point of belief. It, it's something that you embody. It flows through your veins, comes from the roots of our intuition, which is what connects us to the rest of reality. It's uh, it's so powerful. I mean, for me, I've spent every waking moment involving myself in in this is my passion. But listening to you, I'm understanding that you've gone very, very deep into these things and, and it's exceptional. It really is fascinating. And for me, especially like a sort of kid in a sweet shop at the moment, but I think what you mentioned at the end there reminds me of your bouncer of the heart comment uh, that's gone earlier in terms of that. I mentioned about the crisis moments that kept appearing in my my life because of essentially that intellectual logic, mm. that that formulaic way of calculating my way to what I consider to be life through the mind. Essentially the mind saying, don't worry to the heart, I'll work out what love is, what compassion is, what joy is, what creativity is, what beauty is, all those things. You know, in fact, actually, I'll also look after intuition and inspiration. Just you, you know, you stay there and don't get hurt, you know, don't face those emotions or whatever. And that journey for me has been a big turnaround and a look at the relationship with the unknown, like you said before. And that starts with, for me anyway, that I don't know all these ideas about who I am and everything and, and everything around me, I'm happy to say I don't know, which brings that unknown a little bit into a space that I'm I'm happy to befriend. I'm happy to become friends with the unknown. And then, as you mentioned, the true intelligence comes spontaneously out of spaces that I'm yet, I've yet to know. I can't choose to be inspired. I can't say I'm going to have an inspiring thought. Here it comes. Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> no, and you can't choose to be creative. You're just creative. And it's, it's such a fascinating paradox in a way between this idea about preparing for performance in my world. There is so much you can do, but true performance means letting go. And this was such a big part of when you stood in the change room before a, uh, a big game, as you mentioned about anxiety and things like that, you, everything in your mind is calculating logic. You're what ifing, what's going to happen. If this happens, I'll do this. I'll work out how I'm going to be inspired yeah. because if this happens, <laughs> I'll just do this. Yeah. And everyone is so stressed. And yet when the whistle goes, Everyone is so inspired, not because all of that preparation has led to that performance, although physically the conditioning and everything is required to, to at least allow you to do what you need to do. But the actual internal experience is that you just let go. Yeah. And all that preparation, the value it has is to give you confidence to allow yourself to let go. Yeah. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, I needed a lot of confidence. So I did a lot of preparation. That's for sure. Because of our narratives and all that. Look, I have nothing against preparation. I, I do a lot of it as well. But the reason I think that um, to get out of the way of nature and allow nature to do whatever it, it is that it wants to do through you, it's so difficult to allow that to happen, to just allow the world to do through you what it wants to do through you. Why is it so difficult? Why has it become so difficult? It was second nature for our ancestors of not so long ago. Why is it so difficult? I'll tell you what I think is the reason. And then whether this is a compelling story or not, you, you be the judge. <laughs> we feed on meaning because we are natural beings and that's how, how nature is put together. If nature is mental, that's the name of the game. It's about meaning. That's how mind operates. But if we come to a point in our evolutionary history in which we sever our contact with the fountainhead of meaning, the very roots of our being, we will need to fluid compensate, which is a well-known psychological phenomenon. If you sever your contact with the fountainhead of meaning, you have to find a replacement. And one, and again, this is hardcore theoretical psychology, clinical psychology as well. One very common way to fluidly compensate for a sudden absence of meaning within a culture is to find closure. I used to work at CERN back in the 90s. We spent in the order of 10 billion euros to prove to ourselves that the Higgs boson existed. 
which we pretty much knew existed. We just didn't have the statistics to make an announcement of a discovery. Uh, so we needed the high energy accelerator, the LHC, and two enormous experiments, the Atlas and the CMS. I worked on the Atlas one. Why did we spend 10 billion euros to prove to ourselves that the theoretical particle actually existed, even though it has and will not have any technological application for the foreseeable future? We did that because we are desperate to find closure. If we believe that we are in a purely dead material world and that nothing has ultimately any meaning, at least we get one up on this world by understanding it and finding closure. If you lose a loved one, at least you bury that person properly. You get closure. When a culture loses maps towards meaning, that it has inherited from its ancestors, it will try to replace that in three or four different ways, a big one of which is closure. And that applies fractally, not only at society at large, but to us individually as well. So you will try to find closure if you cannot get the fulfillment and the meaning you ache for, you will fluidly compensate by at least explaining to yourself what's actually going on. And it is this very process of trying to account for everything that makes it impossible for us to step out of the way of nature and just allow it to flow through us. Because we are so busy trying to find closure, trying to explain to ourselves why it happened or why it may happen that we don't step out of the way. We don't, we don't allow things to just be through us. My, my best friend, the founder of Essential Foundation, Fred Matter, he found the, the perfect words to, to say this. He says, just allow yourself to be thought. Allow yourself to be felt. Don't think, don't feel, just step out of the bloody way. Allow yourself to be thought by nature. Allow yourself to be felt by nature because the thing that thinks and feels is not you. That subjectivity that thinks and feels is not your personal self. Your personal self is a narrative within that subjectivity. It is one more of the thoughts. And if you just allow yourself to be thought and be felt, things will be a lot easier. Now, of course, you cannot go all the way down that road because it is your ego that has to make sure you have a roof over your head, over sure. your head and food on the table because that's impersonal force of nature that that is us it doesn't give a damn about your safety you know if, if you fail and you die it finds somebody else <laughs> <laughs> so the individual you has to be on the sidelines making sure that you know nature is kind of crazy going in a certain direction here i have to make sure that you know i have continue to have a roof over my head and I don't jump over a precipice because th that's not nature's business. That's the ego's business. The ego is a tool. So it should play that role. And you can even, and I do that, I, I personalize this impersonal force in me, but I personalize it so I can have an inner dialogue with it. Like if it's going too far, say, no, wait a moment. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I need to pay the bills and I, I need to have health and make sure that my loved ones are safe. So give me some slack here so I can take care of myself. But I promise you after I've taken care of myself, I get out of the way and I'll let you do your thing again. But nature, if you can pay attention to your inner life, you will notice the impersonal in you. It's clamoring to express itself. And it has very little regard for whether you will look good, whether you get the credit. This stuff doesn't exist. It's not part of its language. It's made up stuff. We made, we made that stuff up. Credit, regret. Mm -hmm. You can feel the impersonal. If you just allow yourself to, to pay attention to it, or as Fred says, if you allow yourself to be felt and allow yourself to be thought. I, I really like that. I think, I mean, I coach in certain things and certain skills around the sport I work in. And so much of that liberation of allowing it is so, so powerful. I'm interested in just what you're talking about there at the end, certain device that you use. What has this kind of exploration for you done to your experience of life? Do you practice anything? And if so, why do you practice in that way? And as a final part of that, to what end are you practicing? <laughs> yeah, what's the aim? 
I, I am a spiritually very hard head. I'm not spiritual material. It's just not something I have any natural talent for, you know, meditation. And uh, I have had transcendent experiences on high dose psychedelics and I just loaded myself. And that, that's what helped. I also had mind machines and stuff, but it, it doesn't come naturally to me. For me, the exercise has been to learn to get out of the way of nature. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of suffering to learn that. The need for control, for closure, to avoid what you fear is so overwhelming when you embody that narrative that life is about you, that it becomes very, very difficult to get out of the way. You can't even imagine what one means when one says, get out of the way of nature. Most people, and I certainly I, I couldn't even conceive of what that would have meant if I would be now speaking to myself of 20 years ago. My younger self would go like, what is this guy <laughs> talking about? You know, what is he on? What did he smoke? But suffering does that. Suffering uh, has this ability to sort of take your eye off what is banal, what is artificial, what doesn't matter. It has tremendous power to, to sort of bring your eyes towards what actually matter. And, and it will do that and you will still not see it. And it will still take years until you actually see what you're looking at. But suffering, suffering is the ticket. And unfortunately, I, I, I wish it that we could do that in some other way. At least I, I couldn't. But there was a point in my life, I was in my early 30s, I was 33. And I was promoted to director to senior management position in an Europe top 50 company. Well, perhaps top 10, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> but anyway, it was a point in my life where I had ticked all the boxes that I had set for myself when I was 12, when my father died. I created the list, this is what I want to achieve. I want to have a doctorate, a big job, a lot of power, a freestanding house, the, the wife of my dreams, and I had the list. And at that point at 33, I realized I'm there. I have arrived. I've ticked the list. And the first thought was, okay, now let's enjoy because it's been very hard work so far. And then immediately, immediately nature throws a curved ball at you. I found a nodule in my wife's, my wife then, um, we're, we're still very, very good friends, but we are not married anymore. I found a nodule in her, in her breast. It took the doctors two weeks to rule out cancer. And in those two weeks, I realized that I'm not in control of anything. Everything I care about, I can lose tomorrow. And there's absolutely nothing I can do to ensure that it will not happen. I can reduce the likelihood, but I cannot ascertain that it will not happen. And not only am I not in control, I have never been in control, nor will I ever be in control. The whole notion of being in control was a complete illusion of a 12-year-old kid who lost his father and didn't want to lose anymore. And that hit me very heavily. I developed health anxiety about the people I loved and about myself. And if you know what, what that is, it's an all-consuming thing. It turns your world into a very, very, very tiny claustrophobic bubble. But there was one thing I could do, even if I were at the height of anxiety, I could write. And I realized that anxiety was the thing that kept me writing because otherwise I would be having fun. If I thought I was in control and, you know, I had money, I had a house and I, I could just be having fun. I had an excellent salary, but the anxiety, the realization that I was not in control destroyed my interest in the banal in the transitory, the ephemeral, the unimportant. It destroyed that completely. I was unable to muster the energy to go after the banal or, you know, or the pleasures of life, that girl, that car, you know, that trip. I couldn't, I just didn't have it in me anymore. It was replaced by anxiety and I could write. I don't know why, <laughs> because, well, I actually know. Writing is what nature wanted to do through me. And it found a very terrible way to make sure that I got out of the way. It was my anxiety. And then more recently, I developed horrendous uh, tinnitus um, ringing in the ears. My tinnitus is like a dentist's drill. And I have one in each ear. And it's day and night, very loud. Last thing I hear when I fall asleep. First thing I hear when I wake up. 
first year of this, I thought I cannot, uh, I cannot do this anymore because medicine can do nothing for tinnitus. Even if they sever your auditive nerve, there's a 50% chance you will still hear the tinnitus yeah. and then nothing else because then you are, you're deaf. So in the Netherlands, it is legally valid reason for assisted suicide. Wow. So your GP can come to your house and put you to sleep. I considered suicide very, very seriously twice. You know, that for half an hour, a very short amount of time, but in that half an hour, suicide is not an abstraction. It's right there. It's a real, vivid, living, plausible, compelling possibility. And when you do that and you get out of it, you know what it is like to not only lose everything, but to lose everything willingly. Because you've been in that mental space twice, just to make sure that, you know, that the thing is cemented in your head. And that was the next step in that departure from banality and getting out of the way that even decisions I was making, not because I wanted banality, but because I was afraid of losing something, even those were nonsensical. Because, you know, eventually I will lose everything. There is no getting around that. It's a matter of time, which doesn't even exist. And only at that point, with that degree of suffering, and with the help of Fred Matzer, who was sort of following me along this process and saying, yeah, no, now we have nothing to lose because you wanted to lose everything just last week. So what do you have to lose anyway? Get out of the way, do what nature wants to do with you, which for him had a very concrete meaning. You wanted me to do essential foundation with him. He was right, but I forgive myself. He's 77, I'm 47. So he, he had a little more time to figure these things out. But I totally stepped out of the way, man. And, and, and what is amazing about it is that the moment you stop worrying about yourself, the moment your life is no longer about you, that's the moment when you get fulfilled. It's weird. It's when you stop trying that it happens. But it, it doesn't work if you say, okay, I, I will stop trying because then it will happen. And that's what I actually want. It doesn't work that way. If you're not being completely sincere, with yourself, it doesn't work. But I was completely sincere in letting go. And my life is not about me. I have no control. And the fear of losing, I will lose everything at some point. Anyway, I was ready to lose it all willingly. And I still remember that mental state. It's etched into my mind. I can go back there in a moment. Allow me to close my eyes for 10 seconds and I'm right there. I know exactly that's territory in the mind. You let go. Your life is not about me anymore. And now I still have the tinnitus. It hardly bothers me. I hear the wow. dentist's drill right now talking to you. It's there. Both sides. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, we're there. <laughs> you know, I, I left my job. I earn a lot less. I, I didn't give up taking care of myself. I have a house that's paid and I have enough money to make sure that I can eat and have health care to the end of my life and to the end of my partner's life. But I drive eight-year-old car which I plan to use for at least another 10 years. My phone is an, an iPhone SE from 2016. <laughs> the computers are buy, I buy are 40 years old because I like those. The last time I bought clothes was probably three years ago, perhaps, perhaps, if I remember correctly. And I have absolutely no wants beyond what I already have. I, I still am afraid of losing some basic things. Like I don't want war to come to the Netherlands and, and lose my safety and lose my security, lose my ability to be a tool for nature. But there is nothing else I want. If I would win the lottery tomorrow, I don't know what I would do with it. It would be a problem. It would be a weight because even to donate, donating money is very difficult. It's very hard to give away money responsibly. So, there's nothing I want. And if you ask me where do I want to be in 10 years, I have no idea. The whole thing is ridiculous because it's not my plan. My life is not about me. You see what I mean? So the moment your life is not about you, two fantastic things happen. You no longer need to find closure. So you don't need to plan. You don't need to get stressed out about where you want to be in five years. That melts away, it disappears. It vanishes into thin air for the ghost that it has always been. And another thing that disappears, and it's great, is the feeling of responsibility. Because if you step out of the way, you do your part, but you're not responsible for the end result. So if the world will shift to idealism in my lifetime or not, I don't give a 
think this them. I mean, in a sense, I, I do give a damn because I'm doing what I'm doing, but I, I have no feeling of responsibility for the result of what I'm doing. This is nature's problem. You see what I mean? It's like if you're a military operator, you're responsible for the mission, not the result of the war. That's how I feel. I'm not responsible for whether this effort will bear fruit, really, or not. Not my problem, man. <laughs> you know, I'm doing the bidding of something that is much bigger than me. It is responsible for it. And it, of course, is the real me, but let's ignore that part for now. It is responsible for it. So long as I do my part and I step out of the way, my life is rich in meaning, significance, and fulfillment. I don't have a hole in my chest anymore, even though I can, in 10 seconds, close my eyes and be right there. I know what that hole feels like. It's not even a hole. It's a black hole because it has gravitation. It sucks you into a sort of infinite darkness, a sort of a grand void that pulls you in and then you feel it in your neck here. It sort of pulls your head down. I, I, I've been there. I know what that is. It's not there anymore. It vanished the moment I tried to stop it from existing. The moment I got out of the way, stepped out of the way and said, I'm not trying to improve my life anymore. I'm not trying to get to that point where I'm not anxious anymore. I'm not trying to get rid of the tinnitus. I'm not trying to secure my health. The, the moment I stopped all that, it stopped. <laughs> the things that I was trying to stop stopped too. It, it's amazing. That's incredible. You, I could do with just taking that with me to everyone I coach and say, this is what I'm trying to get at. Everything I'm trying to get at. This is, this person has just said it beautifully here. And that's an amazing, an amazing story. The, the, with your life experience now, what's spontaneity, creativity? What are those the heart based things that I was mentioning before that I've been great at that sort of trying to calculate and work out and invent mind wise and basically lose sight of what is it like for you now? Now that you say you, you maybe have that experience of stepping out the way, what happens to that intuition inspiration? It's something that you learn to recognize. And I don't think I would be able to explain to someone who hasn't gone through the process how to recognize that because the impersonal acts through us or communicates to us through what we feel what we think it's not words that come from the outside they are inner feelings too and it's very very difficult if you haven't been through the process for someone to recognize which thoughts and feelings are the impersonal in which thoughts and feelings are their own self-generated bullshit it's very, very difficult to, to, to make that distinction. But over time, the distinction becomes obvious. When you see for the first time that there is a distinction, you find it so subtle, so nuanced. It's very almost impossible to, to recognize it next time around. You only recognize it in hindsight. But then the hindsight starts getting shorter, shorter, shorter. Then you recognize it immediately. Then you become able to even anticipate. It gets to a point where you clearly recognize the impersonal acting through you and you differentiate that from your own ego nonsense, your own agenda, you know, the things that you dupe yourself into thinking that you want and you don't really want, it becomes clear, but I don't know how to help people. I don't have the words. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of paying attention, but it's a very, very subtle form of attention because if you pay attention in a gross, brutish way, you, you make a mess. You will not recognize anything. If you shine too strong a light on it, it, it obfuscates everything. You don't see anything. If you don't shine the light of attention on it, it passes you by. So it's that optimal brightness and contrast setting. You know, The other day, I... I left the industry. I, I only do philosophy now and I lead the foundation. I left the high-tech industry where I spent 25 years of my life. But I still design computers for a hobby. And I've designed a few computers now and it's sold by computer museums and, you know, and I do it all open source. So for free, people can do whatever they want with my designs. But the computer I'm designing now, somebody convinced me that it was so valuable and that I should allow him to build a business with it because, you know, it's very valuable stuff. And why would I donate my work for free? And I went along with that. And then I started feeling bad about it. And I started getting irritated for no reason. My my partner, my girlfriend, 
turned to me and said, I've never seen you so frustrated about a hobby project, an electronics project. And then I realized that the impersonal, the impersonal doesn't want to start a business. The impersonal wants me to just let it out there because what am I doing? Make money? <laughs> Make money? <laughs> What are you talking about? I mean, <laughs> no wrong priorities. You're going to suffer and never get what you want through making money. So I contacted this guy and I said, we are not doing this anymore. The same day I put it all up online, created a Facebook group, invited everybody, shared the schematics, the board design, everything, put it all there. Man, I felt so good that evening. You know, it's one of those reinforcement things that tell you, yes, you recognize the transpersonal now and you can differentiate it from your personal ego-driven agenda. Your search for recognition, name, distinction, personal validation, control, money, resources, you know, that thinking of scarcity, I have to accumulate resources in order to be in control, all that stuff. You can differentiate that stuff from the transpersonal. The transpersonal to me now, wow, it's very clear. I hear its voice sharp mm. and clearly. Yeah. Wow, that's fabulous. Just as a final thing, you've given us so much, uh, Bernardo, and thank you so, so much as well for going deeply into some some really uh, personal things. It's, it's so powerful. What in terms of ambitions, I know you're saying that making money and these kind of things, passion projects, ideas, things that you would love to do purely from a creative perspective, perhaps things that you want to to achieve, not for the outcome benefit, but simply because of the joy of seeing something come to life, manifesting, if you like, has this given you any insight into a, a different way? I know the, the efforted version of you've got to go out there, slog away and just deal with it for however many years. And that's the way you get things done in life. Is this spontaneity and this inspired way and that voice, is it allowing you to see a different perspective on that model? Yeah, uh, it allows me to see its perspective. And it never comes with a well-elaborated context that tells you the whys of that ambition, that goal, and it, it yeah. doesn't tell you that. So it, it, it's a matter of developing a kind of trust. Like uh, you have to hear it. You don't need to understand why, but if you just get out of the way and let it happen through you, it feels good, even though you don't understand the why. Remember, we were talking about closure as fluid compensation. You have to identify your own mind trying to find some form of closure in order to compensate for a felt absence of meaning. So to understand the whys of what nature is trying to do through you is an attempt to find closure. Nature operates on a need-to-know basis. You do not need to know the end result, you know, <laughs> the, the end goal or what's happening. <laughs> now, who the hell are you anyway to need to know that? You don't need to know. All you need to know is what nature is trying to do through you. You need to recognize that and find a way to find a balance between making sure that you have a roof over your head, food and health care and the minimum degree of security and allowing nature to express itself through you in a completely impersonal way that has nothing to do with your personal agenda, your visibility, merit, uh, nothing to do with your safety even. So what I do is when possibilities come to my head spontaneously, like um, let me give you a concrete example. I wrote two books about the work of other people, Jung and Schopenhauer. And I thought, okay, should I write a book about somebody else? Sort of, it's my way to honor my ancestors. And I think we all should have a way to honor our ancestors, to give continuity to the arrow of life. So my way to honor my ancestors is to clarify what I think they meant. So I've done that twice. And then I thought, should I do it again? And then, and then I thought, yeah, let's do this again. Let's do Swedenborg because it makes sense. He was an idealist as well when he was a scientist and mystic, both in one. And he's from nearby, he's from Sweden. You know, I have a uh, half uh, Danish background as well. So it makes sense. Let's do Swedenborg. And I, was, I, didn't, I didn't feel good about it. And then another name popped into my head. as a German called Nicolas von Cuse from the 15th century, the 1400s. He was a Catholic bishop and a philosopher and also a philanthropist. He founded a hospital for old people in the city of Kews, which today is called the Bernkastel Kews here in the west of Germany. And I thought, it's him that I should write. I felt it. 
but I did. I couldn't articulate to myself why, 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 <laughs> why von Cuse. He goes by other names like Nicolas Cusanus, Nicolas de Cusa, the Latinized forms of his name. And I thought, why Cusanus? I couldn't tell myself, but it feels good. And then I was talking to my friend Fred the other day, a book landed in my hands about the work of Cusanus. And the title of the book was On Consciousness and Self-Consciousness, which is a big topic of my work, the distinction between consciousness and self-consciousness. And then by chance, I understood the why. But it, that was by chance. I didn't need to understand the why. You see, nature wants something and you feel that in, 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 in here. I feel it here, here in the upper part of my chest. When I... Imagine Swedenborg, no, <laughs> Pusanus, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Uh, and I don't know why. I mean, in this case, I figured out why, but I don't need to know why. So that's it. It's a question of paying attention to how it feels, at least to me. To me, it feels here. It's embodied. It's, it's the lower part of the neck and the beginning of the chest. I don't know why it's so localized. It's, it irradiates up to here and down a little bit. It's very clear. It's a very physical, oh. embodied uh, feeling. So that has become my compass. So everything now is about that. Even operational issues I'm, have been weighing in my head whether I should move to another website provider because the Essential Foundation is, has had already three times availability problems with the provider we are using today. But it's a lot of hassle, you know, to move to another provider, create backups, change the DNSs, and you may have downtime and all that. And then I was like, okay, st staying with these guys? Mm -hmm. uh, moving? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Everything is like that anymore. You have no plan. You have no long-term perspective that you write down about where you want to be in five years, you have no idea. Maybe nature pulls a curved ball on you and tomorrow you start feeling very differently about what you should do. It has happened before like this. So you have no idea, but you develop one a subtle form of attention to discern the voice of the impersonal and two, a kind of trust that doesn't lead to anxiety uh, doing something that you don't quite understand why or how it will achieve its objective. I think mystics would call it a, a type of surrender, mm. not anymore trying to be in control. The speak of trust and, and that awareness, it's, it's so powerful. It, it's, it felt like when you're in your own way, whatever that, that is, has it felt like that's where the logic is, trying to find the why first and trying to get all the guarantee first that it's all going to work out it's basically operating through mistrust in order to okay. earn trust. Um, mistrust and control. And control. Beautiful. It's so aligned with everything, I think, in terms of human potential, that we think that in this mental logic and intellect and in getting these types of understanding, in that knowing that you're speaking about, not the deeper spiritual knowing, but the knowing of, I know who I am, I know this, I know this, everything I know will allow me to work this out and I'll get there. But actually this space of infinite potential in trust and subtle awareness where it's you're not aware of it's not you on you it's you becoming aware to something bigger maybe and trusting something bigger or whatever it is the game of trying to make it through control and certainty is an impossible game it's nietzsche's ubermensch it <laughs> it it will not work because it doesn't matter how strong disciplined intelligent capable you are, you can't control all the variables that, that are relevant to the end result. There are just too many variables, too many things that are fundamentally out of control. And if you think deeply about it, you realize it. And that realization leads to anxiety because it lets you know that, well, I actually need even more control. And it's a loop that uh, you hope will bring you to a place that it, that it cannot take you to. You cannot be in control. You cannot have certainty, not even high statistical certainty. The game is way too complex. It, it, it's, it's a chaotic system in the technical sense. Slight changes in one of the input variables can lead to wildly different results. And we just are not capable of that kind of precision and that kind of breadth of control of all the relevant variables. I don't think one can find peace that way unless one doesn't think too deeply about it. Like I didn't prior to being 33, I, I didn't really realize how many variables there were involved. So I thought I was in control, but as you mature, 
And life teaches you all the other things that play a role, all the other, the other things that can happen. You And you realize that you're not in control to try to continue to play that same game of finding control, finding certainty. I don't know, maybe it works for other people. For me, I think it would lead to mounting anxiety. And I've, I've, I found my way out of it, not because I tried to find my way out of it. It's like sort of life sort of kicked me in the butt or pulled me through through the air mm-hmm. in a direction where I had no option but to give up on that. And when you give up on that, then you start seeing the alternative. There is a non-rational form of trust. I can't explain why I should trust nature because nature is a bloodbath, right? I mean, it's a shit show. I mean, the animals kill each other to be able to survive and they kill each other slowly and painfully. You know, storms come and destroys entire towns of righteous people who did nothing to deserve that. Nature is a shit show. Our sun will become a red giant in 5 billion years and this planet will evaporate, literally. Why should I trust? that impersonal force that doesn't seem to pass any value judgment whatsoever, completely morally neutral, very apt to suffering. Why should I trust that? I don't know. (laughs) I don't bloody know. All I can say is that there is something in me that feels like this is the way to go. You are okay. Wow. You're okay. Leave it in the hands of nature. If you think it's not reliable, you are even less reliable. So, for now, between the fire and the, <laughs> and the hard place. <laughs> <laughs> Bernardo, thank you so much for all your time, all your energy, and for bringing you to this. It's been an immense pleasure, and I wish you all the best for everything going forward. And if you ever feel you can bear another few hours with me, I will definitely take more of your time. Thank you so much. Sure, let, let's do that. I enjoyed this conversation very much. Normally, I get interviews that are all too formalized, too planned, too thought through. When you're spontaneous, you open yourself up immediately. And before I even answer the first question, you already put yourself out there, you know, heart on your sleeve. I appreciate that. It's very rare. So I'll certainly come back. And just like that, we're at the end of another episode of I Am. I'm so, so grateful to all of you for listening in. I'm enormously keen that this be a two-way conversation. So if you've got any thoughts, questions, ideas, anything that's been inspired by these conversations, anything you just want to get off your chest and get out there, then please send them across in the reviews or just get in touch on social media. I absolutely love holding these types of discussions. I do believe there is no more powerful an opportunity in life than to look at what we can make of our time here on earth, individually and collectively. There's so much scope and depth in these conversations and all the learnings and lessons I do feel are limitless. If you haven't already, and you want to know a little bit more about why I'm holding this space and talking to these guests, then do head over to the Tuesday episodes. There I'll explain my journey and my history with these people. I'll also use this time to answer any of your questions, so don't hesitate to get in touch, and I'd love it if you'd rate, review, follow, and subscribe to the show. Until next week, have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to I Am with me, Johnny Wilkinson. This show is brought to you by Max Creative. The executive producer is Megan Hill-Smith, and our editor is Kit Melson. <laughs>